Thank you all for enduring the weather. A minute here. If you have your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 11. Here the Bible says, and the whole earth was one language, imagine that, and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime, and they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And let's read right there. This shows how cunning and crafty man can be, can't it? Now, God never told him to do this directly. And when you look at this, it's easy to look at it even in the Old Testament and say, they're going to build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. I've had people read that and say, yeah, they, they could really couldn't do that. You, you, you think that? Why did, God have to inter why did God have to intervene? You know, God has blessed us with powerful brain, just what we do with it is what we get in trouble. Let's see what happens. Verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men build. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Now, this in itself doesn't necessarily sound real bad, but this is not what God told them to do. I tell people we got to be careful with that. Another example of this for, for us is when you go to the New Testament, you all, you all have heard of Cornelius, right? Before Cornelius was baptized, was he saved? But he was a good man, wasn't he? He did great things, didn't he? People try to try to do that today. I remember when I was at Sunset and they had a preacher that came in and there was a lady there who was, uh, she said she was a Christian, but all she talked about was the Roman Catholic Church. And when the gentleman was done, he was a guest preacher. When he was done preaching, uh, he had made some comments about the Catholic Church and some things that were going wrong. And I watched her face and I said, she's going to ask him something about it. She said, sir, I have a direct question. She went for the gun, Brother Slova. She said, do you believe Mother Teresa went to hell? I said it just like that. And I love how the preacher answered it. He says, if she wasn't baptized for remission of her sins, her and anybody else would go to hell. He stuck with the Bible. He would try to set her up because what, what she was looking at was, look at, look at all this great stuff that she's done. I don't know if you've seen it. I've watched a documentary about quote-unquote Mother Teresa. Did a lot of beautiful things, but that you don't work your way to heaven. No matter how good the works are, you don't work your way to heaven. Cornelius did some phenomenal stuff. God himself even said his works will come up as all before the Lord. But he still had to be baptized. And as, as obvious and as easy as that seemed, there are still people in this world today that try to count it. Well, they were good people. I've even come close to debate people in the Church of Christ. 
whenever it comes up talking about, I'm not trying to dance in this man's grave. I'm just trying to hold true what the Bible says. He said, yeah, Billy Graham did a lot of good stuff. I said this in, in uh, Bible class. And I said, excuse me, I didn't hear you. He said, Billy Graham did a lot of good stuff. And I said, well, are you saying he made it to heaven? And he looked kind of funny, turned his head. I said, I've watched Billy Graham on YouTube. I have never seen him promote the gospel of Christ. Did he do some good things? Yes, a lot of people do some good things. But you got to be clear with people. And I, I, it, it bothers me when people try to do it in a way where it's like they're saying he's okay, and then they'll lean on, well, you really don't know. Well, I know what the Bible says. And the Bible doesn't say that that's salvation. So why would we do that? You know, there are things that can be morally great about what people do. But are they spiritually what God would have us do? Remember when Peter himself was talking to Jesus? And Jesus was telling him that he had to go to the cross? You remember what Peter said? God forbid. You know what, what, you know what Jesus said? You, did Jesus say, oh, Peter, you know, thank you for caring so much. You know what Jesus said? Get thee behind me, Satan. And I love going to that scripture. It's not that he just was trying to be cold to Peter. He was just letting him know. Moral things are moral things, but you better deal spiritually with spiritual things. This is a spiritual thing. I freely give myself. Understand that. Yes, that's a hard. You know, I don't. I think any one of us could say if we saw Jesus being crucified, that's a hard thing to look at. But do you realize that's what brought our salvation? The Bible says, as it is written. And we have to hold true to that. I'm amazed how the gospel is being twisted more and more over and over again. I don't know if you guys heard, somebody's making a movie that's going to be about where Jesus, it said Jesus actually married Mary Magdalene. And all I said was, show me one scripture. We know she washed his feet. You said she married him. We know she was never the same when she came across Christ. That equates to marriage? They're just trying to make a great story to pull people in. But we got to be careful not to take that as spiritual truth. Before you know it, people will be using that as spiritual truth as opposed to looking at what the Bible says. But now getting back to the context here, it looks like what they were doing could be a good thing. One language, they were staying together to build a city that the, 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 the building towers could almost reach heaven. And say, Let's see what God says. About it. So we got to do what God says. Do. The Bible says, verse 7, Go to, let us go down, and there confound thy leg. Notice also what it says, go to, let us. What does that imply? And that's low-hanging fruit, guys. I, I know it's raining and you feel sleepy. I heard somebody starting to talk. Yes. That's the Godhead. Let us go down. Let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. You see, God had a totally different will, and he wanted them to be in their will. Verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they, let, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. What, 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 why do you think that says it? Why is it called Babel? Once again, low-hanging fruit. Brother David. Say again. I didn't hear you. That's right. Bab when you babble, you're confused. And that's what God intended because he, he expected them to scatter themselves abroad, not stay right there. Bible says, therefore is the name of it called Babel. 
because the Lord did that, did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. I, I read a blog years ago about people having a problem with, well, it says the whole face of the earth. And they said, all the way across? Anybody answer that for me? It says, the Lord scattered them. And he told them to go upon all the, and he scattered them upon all the face of the earth. And people, people on this blog had an issue with, with the whole world? What's going on there? Hey, Brother Lopez. What's going on there? You know, you, you know, just to, just so to set the record straight, it was the whole known world. It wasn't as wide and, and, and wide apart with human beings as it is now. It was actually a smaller area. So when it says the whole earth, it's the whole known earth at that time. You know, you've heard of, uh, you ever heard of a guy called Alexander the Great? He said he conquered the world. The world wasn't as widespread as he conquered the then known world. You have to keep that in mind. You know, that wasn't a uh, Liberty City or Hialeah back then. It was, that was just dry land. So he's talking about the then known world where there was human civilization. That wasn't as widespread as we think. Not yet, especially in Genesis. Verse 10. Yes, JV. Say again. No, I'm not saying the the the, the, the land existed. It wasn't called Russia. And there wasn't necessarily people on it yet. This is still the beginning. We're talking about the then known world. The world that we knew where there was people there. And and here we're talking at the very, very beginning. They haven't been off the ark that long. And they're already disobeying God. Thank you, JV. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was a hundred years old and begot Arphax. And two years after the flood. And after Shem lived, after he begot Arphax, 500 years, and begot sons and daughters. Can you imagine just living that long? Can you imagine what you would see if you met somebody that lived 500 years? I often think about that when I read the Old Testament, like Methuselah, 969 years. Can you imagine if it was that, that way now, what you would see? Gives entire new meaning to grandkids, huh, Sister Lopez? <laughs> That's a long, you would see a lot. The Bible continues. And Shem lived after he begot Arphax and, and 500 years and begot sons and daughters. And Arphax lived five and 30 years and begot Selah. And Arphax lived after he begot Selah 400 years and three years, and begot sons and daughters. And Selah lived 30 years, and begot Eber. And Selah lived after he begot Eber 403 years, and begot sons and daughters. And Eber lived 430 years, and begot Peleg. And Eber lived after he begot Peleg 430 years, and begot sons and daughters. When I start reading these long genealogies, I always like to say, it it, it, I'm sure it meant something to them when this was done. But, but when you get into, into heavy Bible study and you're looking up names and to figure out where they came from, having a listing like this can be very, very crucial to your study. Yes, Sister Lopez. How old was the earth? It wasn't millions and millions of years. Mm -hmm. I can't give you a specific number. I just know it's in the thousands 
according to archaeological testing. But the Bible doesn't tell us how open it is. So neither can I give a specific number. The reason why I want to stress why genealogies are powerful, and I think I've told you all this before, is it a uh, I'm trying to remember, it's been about six months since I've seen this uh, argument on, on YouTube, and it was real interesting. One person was saying the Jews killed Jesus. Another person was saying the Romans killed Jesus. And then in the same debate, one person was claiming, well, Jesus was a Jew. Get everybody else. And I was like, well, they're, sh they're trying to use division with nationality. You know, you know how you can settle that? First of all, how do you, there's two questions there. Who sent Jesus to the cross? According to scripture. It's quiet. Who sent, did you send Jesus to the cross? You know how to find out who sent Jesus to the cross? Just go look in the mirror. That's what sent him to the cross was our sin. Not Roman sins, not just Jewish sins, but mankind sin is what sent them to the cross. As soon as I'm finished, I'll turn it over to you, JV. But all of our sins sent them to the cross. Is that not true? And secondly, he gave it up freely. Nobody sent him to the cross. He gave it up freely. As the song says, he could have sent 10,000 angels. But he didn't. He freely gave it up. Even when the leader said, when Jesus, when he was speaking to Jesus, and Jesus was quiet, he says, don't you know I have the power to either send you or release you? You know what Jesus said to him? You wouldn't have any power if my father didn't give it to you. Ooh, for the one line. So nobody can blame anybody for the sins but ourselves. And we should be thankful for that. Now, getting back to the genealogy question. Yes, Jesus came at the time when he was Jewish. That's no doubt. But when you trace the genealogy, anybody know what you find in this genealogy? You can trace the line of Shem. You can trace the line of Ham. And you can trace the line of Jackie in the genealogy of Christ Jesus. So people say, how do you answer that? You say, everybody? I said, they usually divide humankind up in nationality and ethnicity. You know what I call as Jesus' nationality? Humanity. Because he had everybody in there. But what was his ethnicity? You know what his ethnicity was? Divine. You can't get past either one of them. It's not for us to get caught up in his race. I heard a preacher say we need to be more concerned about his grace. We don't need to get caught up in his skin. What is that going? What good is that going to do us? Bragging rights, right? We need to get caught up in our sin. And it's both both resolved. In Christ Jesus. What did Isaiah say? He has no, there's nothing about him. And you translate that Isaiah 52. Says there's nothing, nothing about him fleshly that we would desire. In other words, we wouldn't walk past him and say, ooh, man, tall and chiseled, look good. It wasn't like that. What made him attractive for us is spirituality. Because by his stripes we are healed. And it talks about who can believe his report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. What report will, uh, will touch us to the point of salvation? It's called the gospel of Christ. That's only through one man through our history, and that's Christ Jesus. But never let anybody get you into, into barking, arguments. 
there's two. I haven't dealt with them in a while, but there's two that get me. And they're on both sides, the black side and the white side. Sometimes you'll see even sometimes Bible school material. And he'll have blue eyes, Jesus with blue eyes. And don't let it just tear you to pieces. I get it. But that's not, there is not a picture, description of Christ in any scripture in the, in the Bible. It came from the Renaissance artists. And then we have the other side where they say, well, you know, he had kinky hair. Where in the Bible does it say that? Well, it said he had hair like lamb's wool. And I tell people, read that whole context. You're taking one piece out and making it a physical feature. What about the eyes of flaming fire? What about the rainbow roundabout? You're going to take, you're going to take all of those and pull one out. The, the lamb's wool meant he was the lamb of God because he took away the sins of the world. Remember that scripture? There is no physical description of Jesus in the Bible. So why do we want one so bad? You see, the world wants to make Jesus fit them as opposed to us fitting what the Bible says. JV, I've, been, I've gone on long enough. Mm-hmm. But why is that important? But see, but see I'll, I'll always ask, why is it intriguing? That caters more to the flesh than more than the spirit. I always still go back to how was that going to aid your life in any way? How was that going to aid your life in any way? Knowing if he was 6'6", 280, could bench 340 pounds, how was that going to aid your life? And, but knowing that when you tie to his blood, you can have life eternal. Knowing that if you follow, if you put on this mind as Christ told us to, you can make it to heaven. That trumps any physical feature. Yes. Mm -hmm. But our sins were there. But our sins was carried to the cross. He, he allowed them to. That's the thing. No, nobody forced him to the cross. He did it freely because he knew. That's why it says he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. The joy was us. The Romans couldn't make him get on the cross. He could have got out of that if he wanted to. He had the power. No matter what the Jews said, he could have got out of it. But he knew what the Old, what the old Testament scripture said. And he knew what mission he was on. It was to save us. It was it's the, the probably the greatest selfless act in the world. He says, I'm going because of you and your sins. Even if you don't believe in me, it's there. It's an opportunity. That's incredible. That is. Mm-hmm. Because uh, the, the question for those on, on YouTube is, for the Lopez said, what was the purpose of Judas? It's kind of, I'm going to liken it like to Pharaoh in the Old Testament. God knew what Pharaoh was going to do. He did it. But God allows free will. He knew Pharaoh was going to keep being stubborn and stubborn. And that's what God used to make a point. You know, those whole, uh, then I'll jump to Judas, those whole nine plagues. They were directed toward the gods that they worship. God always, when you study deep enough, there's always a purpose for mind what God does. For Christ to go to the cross, then I'll come to you, Brother Swift. Christ to go to the cross 
he's using this side of life ways. In other words, uh, jealousy or greed for the silver coins. Because you realize after Judas did it, he realized he was wrong and he wouldn't commit suicide. But the purpose of Judas was he knew Judas was going to do that, and that just tied into leading Christ to the cross. A person could easily say, well, he could intervene and say, oh, uh, Judas, don't do that. But no, God allowed it to be so. Questions, comments? Brother Slocum. Mm hmm Yes. That's right. Absolutely. That is absolutely right. And it's so, does, it's so uh, set up for us to look back and it's supposed to encourage us to want to live more holy, to bring people to Christ. I tell people, this is years ago when we were setting up evangelism with people going out two by two and some people were a little bit nervous. And I said, there's nothing wrong with that. That's natural. I said, but just think about what you have. If somebody blessed anybody in here with $20 million, would you at least help one person in some way? And why is that, JV? You have, I love that word of abundance. I have come that you may live, and you may live more abundantly. Now, we may not have to, I know I don't have $20 million. Some of you may have, but I have a lot of grace. So why wouldn't I extend grace? Why shouldn't it be easy for me to extend grace? Second Peter tells us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How do you grow in grace? You extend grace the way Christ did. The one thing you got to remember about grace, it's often given to people that don't deserve it. That should be a great guide for us. Any, any additional questions before we go on? Yes. Who, who, Sister Van, I mean, uh, Brit, no, I wanted to make sure I can see the right person. Do I say the prince of Port, the princess of Port au Prince? <laughs> go ahead. <coughs> what, what word did you say? Oh, maturity? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we have to hold on, hold on, we gotta be careful. You're saying you choose to accept Christ as you are? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to add something to what I'm saying. I'm saying be careful with that. Because when you go to, when, when people see you, when we show people who Christ is, we don't have to show them that, you know, he's black like me or he's white like me. People will listen to you when they see how much you love them and how much you care. 
If you're on the side of the road and it's storming the way it was today and, you're, and your car won't start because you don't have gas, somebody pulls up, you okay? I'm out of gas. Oh, don't worry about it. I got some in my trunk. Fills up your car and it gives you $30 to go and fill up some more. Does it matter what race they are? Does it matter what nationality? That's what we want people to see. We want to see that's what the body of Christ represents. We want people to see him through his word, not necessarily make him fit a box, because that's where we get in trouble. Because then when we get into doctrine, it becomes a problem. Just let them see it. Just let them see the word. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, Sister Jewel? I still I can't hear what you're saying. No, no, no. You 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 have it, but but what scripture do you have? What what scripture do you have to say when you say consider Christ as you? What does that mean? You mean your nationality? I'm asking questions. He's not your nationality. He, your nationality is in his blood. But why didn't Christ promote that then? Because it's dangerous. It's dangerous when we look at, oh, you know, Christ is this, this color. That's not the Bible doesn't promote, doesn't promote that anyway. Christ himself didn't go there. As a matter of fact, you know, when Christ was on the cross, you know, it was two people that was there at the cross. John and his mother Mary. You know what Christ said to him? In the midst of his anger, he said, son, uh, mother, Mother, son. In other words, he wanted John to take care of his mother. He didn't go into make sure we look after all of the Jewish people, look after all this. And people were pushing through to get to talk to Jesus. And you know what they said? His family was up there. His biological family. And they said, your family wants to see you. You know what Jesus said? This is my family. There are scriptures for that. We, should, we, we shouldn't get, we shouldn't tie in any way to a nationality. That's dangerous. That's what a nation of Islam is growing to. Because they tie into a nationality. They're not the only ones. We got to be very careful. That is not Christianity. Christianity is the church of Christ. Church has no color. Look at Revelation when it talks about heaven. It says all creeds and nationalities. It doesn't separate and say, you know, it's, it's, it's more blacks than whites and a little more Latins than white. It doesn't do that. We're all one in Christ. To go below that, we have to be careful. Because that's how false doctrines are started. And flat out, that's how some cults are started. The Nation of Islam is a cult. And it's a shame. I'm sorry, sister, but I can't agree with that because that's not scripture. It's not scripture. Okay, that was the first bell. Okay, we're still good. In verse 18, and Peleg lived 30 years and began Reu. And Peleg lived after he begot Reu 209 years and begot sons and daughters. And Rehu lived two and 30 years and begot Surak. And Renu lived after he begot Surak 207 years and begot sons and daughters. And Surag lived 30 years and begot Nahor. And Surag lived after he begot Nahor 200 years and begot sons and daughters. And, Nah and Nahor lived nine and 20 years and begot Terah. Does that name Terah sound familiar? And it's amazing how certain names will jump out. Who do we know as Terah? Anybody know? Some you study pretty deep. Does that name stand out? Or should we keep going? I'm just I'm just gonna remind you as we read further, that name is gonna stand out. He's the father of somebody very specific that we know. Who said that? Why did you wait, wait, why you wait? You you're trying to leave me in suspense? That's right, he's the father of Abraham. And Terah lived, look at the next verse. And Terah lived 70 years and begot Abraham. Nahor and Aran, and these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abraham, Nahor and Haran, and Haran begot Lot. Who was Lot to, to Abraham? 
I have some of these. I have one in the back. Yes, David. No, not grandson. Nephew. There we go. Nephew. And Haran died before his father, and Terah in the land, his nativity, and Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. And the name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came into Haran and dwelt there. What was ironic about where they were already? What did the Bible say they were right here? Verse 31. Canaan. What's ironic about that, Brother Steve? That's right. When, when we get into, when they get into battles, they're going to try to work their way back to Canaan. And notice they were already there. In the last verse of verse 32, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, you have to do some research to see this. Was, was Terah a follower of God? Anybody? No, he was not. So wouldn't it be easy to say that Abraham wouldn't be a father of God, or at this time, Abram would not be a follower of God? It would be easy to say that, right? This is why it's so important for us to study God for ourselves. I happen to be blessed. I've been brought up in a family that went to the Church of Christ. But I still had to study to see it for myself. It wasn't just I was going to church with my my mother and grandmother, just like I followed that. Yeah, I had a baby ticket for a while because I was following them. But at some point, I had to pray and for my own. Thank you. We're going to stop there. Thank you all so much for your insight and your questions. Lord's will, if the Lord permits, we'll pick up Sunday at chapter 12 if you want to read ahead. Thank you again. Thank you, Brother Donnell. Amen. Young brother comes prepared, and he uh, leads us in these songs, so we're thankful to God for you, uh, young brother. Uh, building that confidence every single week, and for the seasoned brothers, i.e. Brother Rick and Brother Tyrone, thank you all seasoned brothers for teaching classes, you know, as well. Amen. <laughs> From time to time, I'll give you just kind of a, a preview of where we're going on Sunday, and we're going to do that tonight for just a few minutes. Hebrews chapter 12. Good evening to the saints of God. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Be the Lord's will, we're going to touch on this on Sunday and build on it. But just, it's kind of, you know, Rick and I both ran track in, in high school. And sometimes when we would train, we'd have, there was ankle weights. Remember those, Rick? Those old school ankle, you put the ankle weights on and that can help you. Uh, you know, you're running with more weight on you. And so then you take the ankle weights off, you get into a real race. You feel like, my goodness, you were shot out of a cannon. Yeah, I could beat Miguel. I can just, I'm moving now because I've trained with excess weight. And we are carrying some weights around. we got to be mindful of the weights we carry around in our lives. On Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrew writer is basically stating, Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed, we're also compassed about, in other words, surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin and the sin which doth so easily beset us. There are things we can do that can cause us to stray away from the Lord. We don't want to have any excess weight, any excess burden. You know, we sing the song, take it to the Lord and leave it there. Sometimes it's guilt. Sometimes it's shame. Sometimes it's envy, jealousy. Anything that can weigh you down is excess weight. So the Hebrew writer is saying, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which doth so easily beset us. It can, that beset really speaks to that can easily entrap us. It can easily snare us. It's like falling into, it's like digging a, setting a trap and walking right in it. People set traps for animals, hunting and all of that other stuff. So weights can get in the way and we can easily be ensnared or caught up 
in whatever it may be. And let us run with patience. Let us run with perseverance. Translating these words for you. Let us run with perseverance. You got to be able to get through some stuff. Saints, I will encourage you tonight. We'll encourage you again, Lord willing, on Sunday morning. You all get to sneak. You know, you get a movie trailer before the whole thing. You're getting a movie trailer tonight. So we got to be, we got to have some resilience. When trouble comes your way and challenges come your way, you got to get through in order to get to. Let us run with that perseverance, that mindset that, okay, it's hurting right now, but I got to get through this. Let us run with perseverance. The race that is set where? Not behind us. Not beside us, before us. Keep our eye on the prize. Run forward. One of the things Coach would always tell us, Brother Rick, is don't ever look back. When you start, when that gun, they, when I say the gun sounds, they start the race with the, the starting gun, as they called it. So once that race starts, run. The last thing you want to do, you're running as fast as you can. And then let's say I'm racing Miguel. I'm just going to work with you tonight, Miguel. I'm racing Miguel. I'm looking back to where Miguel is. He's getting closer to me. And I'm looking back. Oh, my goodness, Miguel's getting closer and closer. I'm slowing down, and he's speeding up. Even if he runs the same pace, I'm slowing down as I worry about him. So one of those weights can be worry. Always looking back. You can't change the past. Oh, I wish I, that never happened. Well, it happened. And it was last year. Maybe it was yesterday. You can't change the past. Amen? Let us run with patience, perseverance, the race that is set before us. But now here's the last piece. Coach would always say, look straight ahead. Well, the Bible already said that. Looking unto Jesus. Keep our eye on the prize. Who is the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the joy set before him. We're going to break that down further in, on Sunday. Endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's our lesson tonight. Don't try to go up the hill with the brakes, with a wheelbarrow, with stuff in the wheelbarrow, and the brakes are on. You still, oh, it's like, this is so hard. Y'all pray for me. Take, let, release the brake. <laughs> Get some of that excess weight and move. That's the encouragement tonight. Think about the weights that are in your life. Think about what's causing you to, you know, you could be, should be moving at a, at a faster pace. It could be, quote, unquote, so-called friends, things that may get in your way. Focus on Christ. Let's continue to grow and do what we can while we can. If you're here tonight, God has made it possible for us to be in. So you got to get in the race. We got the, you know, the, you know, life. People say, you know, the, the human race, you know, life. We will be born physically. We will die physically. But we have to be born again. We become a new spiritual creature. And then when we die, we die faithfully in Christ. Revelation 2 and 10, we can uh, have a crown of life. Revelation 14, 13, blessed are they that die in the Lord, faithfully in the Lord. So if you, how do you get in the Lord? It's God's plan of salvation, not mine, not the eldership, not the deacons, not something we read. Well, something we read, all right, but it's in the word of God. It's God's plan of salvation. You must hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins, how he was buried, and how he rose again the third day. Jesus Christ is the only Savior of the world. It ain't Mother Teresa. It's not Billy Graham. It's no one else. It's Jesus Christ. He is the only Savior of the world. If you believe that with all your heart, you are, are you willing to repent of your sins? Change your mind. Confess Christ to be who he is, the Son of the living God. And upon that confession, tonight, not some special Sunday, tonight, today is the day of salvation. We will baptize you, fully immersed in water, sins washed away, all your sins washed away. You rise up to walk, to live to run in this race of life because you're a new spiritual creature. Troubles will come. Trials will come. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, of a love, sound mind. And we wanted to be faithful and focused on what God would have us to do, being faithful until death. So the question is, why not tonight? Song has been selected. If you need to stand, if you need to respond in any way, please do so right now. And even on Zoom, as we stand and sing the song of encouragement, won't you come? Oh, why not tonight? <clears throat> Time. Oh, do not let the word depart and close thine eyes against the light. 
Poor sinner, heart not thy heart, be saved, oh, tonight, oh, why not tonight, oh, why not tonight, will thou be saved, then why, why not tonight?